Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Wallace. I have the, uh, the privilege of being the moderator this afternoon. Uh, you're here for Humanizing Our Work, the Humanizing Our Work session. We have two presenters, uh, Orlando Carrion and uh, Johnny Wilson. Uh, I will quickly introduce them and hand it off to them. So Johnny Wilson is a lecturer and teacher supervisor at UC Santa Cruz. He has been grateful to have been a part of C. Turin's work on teacher supervision from the start of the project. He has uh, an abiding interest in math ed and uh, does research. Do, re do reach out to him in activities that are working to improve teacher mentorship and supervision or to talk to him about interesting math teaching stuff. Uh, and then Dr. Carl Young is the son of immigrant parents with roots in Guerrero, Mexico. He is a teacher educator at the University of California, Davis. His interests include teaching and researching with a decolonial and social justice framework to disrupt how discourses of race, culture, ideology, and power affect BIPOC communities. Current topics include effective teaching practices of Latinx youth, ethnic studies, advocacy and teacher ed, and culturally sustaining practices. He currently lives in Napa with his life partner, Angela, and his two daughters, Florentina and Camila. So I believe Johnny is up first. I'll hand it off to you. All right, great. <clears throat> It's great to see all of you again. Um, I'm sharing a link in the chat right now. This is the document we'll be using. And we are going to be sharing today. That was one of the things we cared to do in this conference is talk to each other talk and work together around things. So if you take a look at this document, I'm going to share it on my screen as well. And there's some information for me and Orlando um, to connect. I'm very happy to be sharing this with Orlando. We've had some good conversations about this topic and appreciate sharing in this work with him. Um, we're going to start off with just getting ourselves wrapped around what it means to be human before we talk about humanizing our work. So what I'd like you to do right now is to take a moment, think for yourself first. When you have a chance, when you're ready, think about a time when a teacher, mentor, or coach really connected to you on a human level and promoted your growth, your learning in a humanizing way. So below in this table, you should all be able to write something. What were the qualities of this interaction? What was special about it? What was significant about it? A sentence, a few words to get our heads around what it means to be engaged in humanizing practice or to have been a, been a part of somebody's good humanizing teaching. So take a moment to do that. Think for yourselves first. And whenever you want to start writing, that'd be great. And if you've made an entry, go ahead and look at the ones that are being shared by your peers. Take another half minute and we're going to come together. So if we could close right now. Um, I've gone through and I've highlighted a few things. I haven't had a chance to read all of them in depth yet. I will come back to this. But as I was looking through, I saw some things that this really struck me and I appreciate the contributions you've made. I'll give you a, an aside right now. I'm teaching a summer course right now. And, um, working with beginning student teachers. This is their first, their, their second week of the program. And we were talking about third spaces from Chris Gutierrez and others about the spaces that involve, bring in the wholeness of people into the learning space. And so I was thinking about that in terms of beyond academics, coming from a point of love, courageous conversations. I see that listening came up more than once, but this other bit about unique gifts, what makes any particular student, anybody in any particular person in a learning environment, a human, a particular human with strengths, needs, and interests. So appreciate this good start. What um, Orlando and I are gonna do, I'm gonna start with just giving a frame for humanizing teaching and learning. And I'm gonna share a couple of examples shortly, just about some things we've done at UCSC. And Orlando is gonna give you a, a much better take on a project he's been doing with peers at UC Davis. So there'll be points at which you'll be able to contribute and share and ask questions along the way as well. But here's some starters for us. Humanizing teaching and learning. Some quotes from Paulo Freire. Teaching that ceases to be an instrument by which teachers can manipulate students, but rather expresses the consciousness of the students themselves. And I included Rochelle Gutierrez because, like I said, I'm into mathematics education, and she worked with collaborators on a work on, called Rehumanizing Mathematics Education. Um, and we've done some work with that with the um, California Mathematics Council as well. And a quote from Rochelle Gutierrez, 
a student should be able to feel whole as a person to draw upon all their cultural and linguistic resources while participating in school mathematics. So the word whole comes up and culture and language comes up. And Ken Robinson, who's an, an aesthetics educator and arts educator, um, brings up to improve our schools, we must humanize them and make education personal to every student and teacher in the system. Education is always about relationships. Great teachers are not just instructors and test administrators. They are mentors, coaches, motivators, and lifelong sources of inspiration for their students. And I appreciate this one. We have some, sometime I like to have conversations with some of you about how teaching is both art an art and a science. Teaching is an art form. Great teachers know they have to cultivate curiosity, passion, and creativity in their students. So these are some starter ways of thinking about it. I built a table to frame the ways we might think about it or the way that I'm thinking about humanizing education or humanizing my supervision. And I've listed some sources down here at the bottom you can work from as well. Um, so if we look at the two different columns, you can see I plainly put the humanizing column in color and the non-humanizing in gray. But if we think about humanizing practice or interactions, we pay attention to the cultural, historical, and contextual realities of the people involved. Who's there matters and how they are involved and what they bring matters to the activity. A non-humanizing approach is ahistorical, just how things have always been. Taken as given, human influence, construction not given attention. I'll throw in the 1619 project, which has thrown such a, a wrench into ways that people have thought about history as taken as given. The idea of what are the multiple stories? What are the different kinds of stories that come together to, to show that there's different kinds of realities that build up histories and how we come together? Another facet of humanizing practice, a humanizing interaction is it's dialogic, lots of voices, hearing from many, many people. And I'm going back to the 1619 project, um, critical race theory, all those things too, is they're, they're pointing out that there's not a standard narrative. It's in dehumanizing, non-humanizing practice, there's the story, not stories. So if we can think about that in terms of our practice as well. <clears throat> As a mathematics educator, I always appreciate this one too. Humanizing practices are problem focused and the problems are relevant to those involved. And in non-humanizing practices, standardization, one size fits all, this is how we do things rather than this is how we construct things for ourselves. In humanizing practice, the co-construction of activity, we decide together what things we want to be involved in rather than being a widget or an apparatus within some practice. So I'm gonna talk about supervision in a moment. I'll, I'll come to this one. I'll come back to this one in a moment. Another humanizing feature is varied and relevant expressions of ideas. And I do come from the arts as much as I like teaching math, I come from the arts as well. The idea that there's lots of different ways people might show what matters to them, what's relevant to their experience. And non-humanizing practices what matters is what can be counted. Quantification takes precedence and attention is focused on what can be measured. And I'll just throw this out there. If we can't measure it, then somehow it doesn't count. And this is coming from um, Bettina Love's work and some other folks as well. Um, the word joy is becoming very prominent. A couple of sessions I was in yesterday, joy came up. Just the idea of thinking about joy as humanizing. And the other word that comes up for me is faith in humans or faith in our humanity. And we think about non-humanizing practices, something's broken and something needs to be made better, which is also um, a consideration of abolitionist teaching practices as well. Why things that, you know, we need, why are we always working as if people are broken? So I wanna throw out just quickly why I came to this, what, why humanizing practice came from me. Orlando will talk for his, from his perspective as well. So I've been a supervisor for a number of years, and I think about the humanizing aspects of it as the parts where I'm in classrooms with student teachers, having conversations with them about the lived reality of that classroom and the lived reality of their teaching. I think about the non-humanizing aspects of my supervision as the evaluative parts, the accounting for parts, 
the idea of standardization. These are the ways teaching should look instead of in somehow ignoring about the cultural historical realities of the people we're actually working with, the students we're working with as well. The other part of my supervision that I struggle with is what things in my supervision am I focusing on quantifying when I should be paying attention to the varied ways in which student teachers might show their good teaching and how often do I allow them to do that for themselves and how much of my supervision is focused on what can be measured and accounted for instead of relevant expressions of ideas of teaching. And lastly, how much of my supervision do I share in with my student teachers that's about the faith I have in them, the faith they have in me, the joy we might be sharing in together doing the work, and how much of my supervision is about making sure that the state knows that this student teacher is worthwhile and a valid being to be a teacher. So I put those out there as frames for myself um, but I, I'm going to share a couple spaces to consider them. Amy, if you would like to share too, because I'd really appreciate it. We had a brief conversation beforehand. Amy had a reflection on humanizing teaching as well. Um, so here's some spaces to consider in how we humanize our supervision, humanize our practice, the learning environments we share. How are these spaces we inhabit in our teaching and learning liberating? How are they organized for shared voice, shared learning? So if we're taking a humanistic, humanizing perspective, then we should be making it so we hear from different folks. How do these spaces reflect the humanity of those involved? How do they reflect where they're coming from and who's involved? The next instructional design, and I'm going to point at our tools. How are materials, tools, activities focused on problem solving, problem solving? How do they reflect and make the most of all involved? How is activity co-constructed through transformative practice and inquiry? How are we involved together in the activities we're doing in the classroom? And I point, put this one out particularly because of, I'll just throw it out there, the TPA and how much the TPA in of itself as it sits, the way it's constructed pushes us away from co-construction, pushes us away from humanizing practices becomes a measure, a quantifiable way of doing teaching that maybe isn't the best way to go about it. And that might be a, a later conversation for some of us. And the last one is mentorship. How is mentorship reciprocal, dialogic? How is mentorship based on faith and joy? So in our everyday activities with our student teachers, at the end of, of a discussion on a, a bit of teaching, how do we affirm the good things that have come from that activity? So Amy, uh, is it okay Do you would wanna share? Your piece, please. Is it all right? Do you put your? Yeah, sure. Um, which parts? Um... Just, just that thing about um, being wholly in and being present, like bringing your whole self into supervision. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. is that where we were? I want to make sure we're in the right place. Yeah, yeah. Um, just speaking both. I, I, I reflect on my experiences as a student and as. Um, uh, so all, all through K-12 as a K-14, 16 <laughs> as a student, but then also as a supervisor. And I was really struck by um, Ijeoma's talk yesterday about how liberating it would be if um, personally, just myself, if I could be myself in these spaces and um, if I didn't have to change the way that I, that I speak, that I, um, that I dress, that I just ways that I even think too. And if by being my more authentic self, I might then give permission to just by modeling it and also liberate my own teacher candidates to let them know that this is, this is okay too. Um, and that not only is it okay, but that it's really valued and that it's really appreciated. I, I hope that in, in that way, if I have, if I'm brave enough to model that, then they can be brave enough to do that too. So I appreciate this, Amy. This, um, you reminded me, it was a thought I had as we were working on this together, how in our work to humanize supervision for our candidates, we're humanizing it for ourselves. When some of these activities, some of the activities we're required to do as supervisors, 
remove who we are. They become mechanical. They become some kind of thing that has to be completed, which takes away who you, so who the other person, who's the receiving person and who we are is discounted and not in set at the center. So um, hold on to this, especially Orlando's presentation will give us some ideas about how supervisors can put themselves at the center and make themselves more valid in what's happening for student teachers. I'm going to give two quick examples, then I'm going to give, give it over to Orlando. Um, the first one is I shared this last year, but I've been thinking about it a lot too. So two activities we've been engaged in. I've been engaged in with student teachers over the last couple of years, mostly to, honestly the result of COVID, just um, how do we do something in the times that we've been in. I shared with the folks last year my, our work with interactive supervision journals. I'm going to show you an example real quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You can ask me about these later if you want to. I know some of you have been working with them too. Um, so when COVID started, we began working with students. I set out these, this activity where we did a weekly journal. My student teachers completed the journal and they set out artifacts for themselves. These are all links to videos they've created. Um, they made videos for their kids. They made the flip grids. They made the slideshows. And then they would set out a problem of teaching. So this is the problem posing part of what's going on. So they gave a description, what was learned, but the challenges that came up became a problem that the student teacher and I would work, with, work through in dialogue as co-constructors of what we needed to work on. And they, we'd work on, um, we'd set out strengths, concerns, next steps, et cetera. So um, the idea behind this, when we connected to what we've set out before, these journals are dialogic. So it's an ongoing conversation. I shared that with folks with this last year. There's a journal this week, there's a journal next week, there's a journal the following week. The thread that runs through is that the teacher, student teacher and I have a conversation, ongoing conversation about their development, who they are. It's very contextual. So it's about their lived reality. It's problem focused. So that means it's a co we get to co-construct responses to it. And it's about encouragement and development. So in the, it, it, you might have noticed there's no place in there where there's a check place or could be where it's like, you completed TBE 1.1, you completed TBE 1.3. It's conversational, it's dialogic, it's a, a meaningful relationship. It's an abiding long-term relationship around teaching between the candidate and myself. And, and taking, up, taking from where Amy was saying as well, I get to take, offer th thoughts that come from my genuine self and my genuine teaching. I have one other thing to share. Um, this is something that I was working on a lot this year, collegial conferences. So taking advantage of Zoom, um, I met with students once in a week, once a week through a big part of the year where three or four students met with me together. We were collegial. That means all the people sitting there, including myself, were all invested in talking about teaching events. So every week, two of the four students would each share some teaching event, again, their choice. And they had a reflective write-up, often from the supervision journal. And then all the members of the conference participated in discussion of a teaching event. So some of you who were with me yesterday, that particular event I shared with teacher Chloe, that was a long conversation. We had a really good conversation amongst peers about what was going on with equity of voice in that. And again, the idea behind this is it's dialogic. And then it's also me not being the center. It's about shared experience. Again, problem focused because the alongside the video that was shared teaching event, a, the student teacher shared questions of practice. It again reflected student teachers particular experience questions and interests and it was moves there were moves to improve and develop teaching and they were co constructor constructed. And this is about building community too. Um, one of the things that strikes me, Amy, and some of the work I was doing with student teachers earlier today about third spaces, the idea of things being familial, like being part of a family, and how that might be some way to think about relationships, organizing our student teachers and their cohorts around those kinds of ideas to make it more human. So in both cases, consideration for learning environment, instructional design, and mentorship had to be taken into account to make a livable and human learning interaction. So those are two examples from my experience. I've shared some ideas about around humanizing supervision. Um, I'm going to move off.
Orlando, thank you so much for being here. I'm enjoying sharing this with you. So welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Orlando Carrion and um, I'm a teacher, uh, supervisor and educator at UC Davis. And um, so I titled this uh, portion of the presentation, Moving Toward Justice Now. And, and one of the reasons why I titled it this way is because it points to um, some of the internal frustration that we were feeling about how slow you know, change takes, right? Uh, and I, I'm sure I'm not um, only the only one thinking about how, how uh, slow change is sometimes because uh, it, if it was like that in my institution, I'm sure it looks like that way oftentimes in your institution as well, right? So we're gonna talk about um, our story, our journey and um, it's, uh, it's an ongoing journey. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit about um, what UC Davis has uh, been doing to move toward justice in that sense. Um, but before this, I wanna ground us. And I'm so glad that um, Dr. Felipe Mercado um, started us off this way um, as well. You can see we're kindred spirits here. Um, but this is a quote from uh, the Iroquois Nation. And this is the way they would, their leaders would make decisions, right? In every deliberation, we must consider the impact on the seventh generation. You know, and so they were make decisions this way, right? Their leadership team, as a matter of fact, the constitution of the United States, some of the founders really borrowed from the Iroquois nation. Um, but they were thinking about, okay, seven generations down the line looking forward, right? Um, what changes now, what decisions making that we make now is gonna affect our seventh generation down the line. But it wasn't only one directional this way, it was also listening and looking back seven generations back. Right? What were our ancestors trying to tell us um, about what is, what is important in the decision making? And are we listening? Or are we, have we stopped listening? And why is that? Right? So it was moving forward and also looking back. Okay? So this is going to guide um, the way we're thinking about uh, teacher education. Um, so these are my uh, co conspirators. Um, you know, starting, uh, this is our multiple subject team. And um, we're gonna start with uh, Kim Holsberry, uh, Dr. Nancy Singh, myself, Trina Ramirez, Elizabeth Forker, Al Mendel, Dr. Susana Mayorga Casanova, and Michael Woodcock, right? And um, we all are uh, co-conspirators uh, differently in our own way, but when we get together in the room, um, it, there just always seems to be um, uh, magic for a lack of a better word, um, and, and always kind of pushing, pushing forward. Um, so some starter questions that we're going to begin with is that we begin with, actually, when we we're thinking about how do we move in this direction? Where do we begin? So the starter questions that we did is, uh, what is it that we're doing well? What do we feel like is working for us, right? And also, we, we listed and started talking about it just through discussion. How can we be, be the program that we want to be? And the way that this happened was that we started having consistent meetings. Um, uh, you know, start every other week from one to two hours starting in the summer of last year. And we started with these questions and we just started writing what everybody was saying, right? And in these conversations, we got to learn a lot about what each of us is doing in our own um, spheres of influence. So this is what we came up with. We started documenting this. And as the nerdy uh, qualitative researchers that we are, we started putting this in bubbles, right? And we started putting this in bubbles and saying, hey, you know, Drina said this, Nancy said this, and we started putting it. And then we started organizing it, right? And so we started realizing that that's something that we really uh, care deeply about is how we build relationship with teacher, uh, with our teacher candidates, and also the importance of them developing relationships with their students. So you can see this just started happening organically. Um, and so in these conversations, we also, um, it was just these beautiful conversations, right? Um, where there's no, well, there was a little bit of agenda, but we were setting the agenda. And one thing that came out out of these was uh, the teacher education should be the most sacred part of the school of, school of education because we are the closest to the babies. And I just want us to think about that for a moment. In one year, the teacher counties that we work with are going to be literally teaching our babies. And I don't just mean that metaphorically, right? As babies metaphorically, we teach, our students teach the professors who are in their school of education, their kids, right? So when I hear the professor say, hey, our, my kid goes to this school, I say, wow, we got our student teachers there. Our student teachers are actually teaching your kid, right? So the interconnection uh, of this is, is really important for us to recognize. And then the importance of the role that teacher education play, plays 
should be front and center of what we do as as a school of edu as a school of education in general, right? Um, because we are closest to the babies. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm going to talk about that we did uh, we did this last year. Um, one of them I'm going to talk in a little bit more depth is the Assigned Bettina Loves book, um, not just as like a book club, but as required reading in all our seminar courses. We created the Humanizing Speaker series um, to center issues of teacher ed. And we embedded Goldie Muhammad's framework into staple documents and assignments such as the EdCPA, the lesson plan, template, um, et cetera. So um, this is the, uh, I'm sure you all have uh, looked at or read um, Bettina Love's book. Um, so we broke down each chapter, right? And each chapter we highlighted sections and we, we broke our, our students into groups, had them dialogue and then report back, you know, what does this look like in the classroom? How can we activate, you know, some of these, um, you know, thoughts and um, ideas that Bettina Love is pushing us to think about, right? And I, there's a link, um, this presentation is in the folder and here's a link to those questions that we asked. And one of the things that, that I really appreciated was in the, was in the final ch uh, chapter, um, we asked our students to, <clears throat> to think about um, we, we posed uh, questions uh, that dealt with the teacher education program. How can we, you know, be a more abolitionist program? Where are there holes in our program? You know, where is there some bright spots in our program? So we asked this question to our students of ourselves so that we can learn about that, right? And so I just think that's a really powerful, um, Johnny talked about dialogic, right? Is to, uh, you know, not just to think of, of, of oppression and inequity happening out there, but also in our own institutions, you know, that we might have blind spots and not be looking at, right? And this was a really powerful moment. And one of the things that really stands out is that our, our teacher, our teacher candidates told us like that how much they've appreciated that space that was created where they can finally say, hey, this is, this is what's happening for me. Um, and this is how I think we can, we can do better. Okay. And it was a, it wasn't an us against them. It was collaborative in that sense, right? Because we, we've created it together. We co-constructed it. Um, the second thing that we did uh, last year was develop the Humanizing Pedagogy Speaker Series. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is to centralize issues um, that occur in teacher education. Oftentimes when we bring in these, these, um, these wonderful speakers, sometimes they, they, they talk about education as a whole, uh, maybe center language or maybe center other areas, but centering teacher ed is, is often not the case, right? With these uh, speaker series, and that's what we wanted to do. We started off with the Kevin Schaefer, who talked a lot about UDL practices. That was our first um, uh, humanizing pedagogy speaker series um, speaker, and then we uh, we ended with uh, but, um, Goldie Mohammed and Curtis Acosta. Goldie Mohammed is a scholar uh, who wrote the Cultivating Genius, and Curtis Acosta is um, is a is a scholar and also an organizer from the ethnic studies movement. And he was one of the practitioners of Tucson, Arizona, the program that got closed. So we had a wonderful dialogue where we asked them, uh, you know, questions about teacher ed. Hey, how can teacher ed be what it's, it's, it's what it should be, right? And that was a really powerful uh, uh, dialogue. The link is there as well, so you can um, you can share it with your students. We use this uh, video to um, to do professional development with our resident teachers, and and to show them, hey, this is what we are. Uh, valuing, right? And, that, and that's a important. Uh, Felipe, um, Felipe um, Mercado talked about trickle um, uh, ripples, right? Um, this is how we are creating ripples in, in our teacher education sphere and with our resident teachers as well. And um, so in, in developing the Humanizing uh, Pedagogy Speaker Series, we also wanted to create a vision statement um, so that we ground ourselves in what is it that we're trying to do with the speaker series. Also, because if Let's just say one of us is, is no longer here uh, tomorrow, right? The, the spirit and, and the reason for why the speaker series, what creators will always live on, right? So I'm gonna ask us to, um, to put our courageous uh, hat on and I'm gonna ask um, for uh, five volunteers to help me read this, um, this uh, vision statement together. If you can just put your name in the chat and the first five folks that, um, that put their names down, we'll go ahead and, and go with them. Um, so if I could have uh, five brave volunteers, um, Joan, thank you so much. You're number one. Let me wait to four more other folks. Uh, Arian, uh, uh, thank you so much. 
Kim, thank you. Let's get two more. Edwina, thank you so much. And Adrian, thank you so much. All right. So I'll start us off uh, with the first line. And then, um, Joan, you'll start with our series aims. OK? So if you can please unmute your microphones at this moment, and we will begin. We begin with the premise that youth are sacred. Joan. Our series aims to expand our capacity to create humanizing educational spaces with our educational partners, school communities, student teachers, and youth. Our goal is to create spaces of belonging where young people may thrive in the quest for personal and social transformation. Central to this aim requires a deep understanding of how society and education have not historically served the best interests of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and other oppressed communities. We are committed to justice and liberation for BIPOC, LGBTQ, multilingual students, students with disabilities, immigrant communities, economically and historically oppressed students. We are committed to walking in community toward justice, not as an end goal, but a continuous struggle toward liberation, dignity, and self-actualization. -actualiz We're committed to acting from love, not for love. We're committed to walking with humility in a world that is constantly changing. We are committed to efforts of justice and liberation to supersede institutional norms of success. We're committed to working in community with educational partners in schools, universities, and the greater community who share the spirit of the Humanizing Pedagogy series. Together, may we grow, reflect, and take action in the spirit of those that came before us and those that will come after us. May the purpose of our gathering be in service of our most precious resource, our youth. Thank you so much. A wonderful read, and I appreciate you all being courageous and, and stepping forward to read this out loud. But as you can see, this became a, a grounding document for us, right? Um, it really grounded us before we got started. Um, oftentimes, when we have our meetings and we invite new folks, because our, our group is growing now, we start off with this vision statement as, as well to ground us in, in what we're trying to do, right? What, what is our vision? What is it that we're hoping to know? And this is our freedom dreaming, as, as Bettina Love is talking about, right? Uh, thank you so much. So, um, you know, uh, Bettina Love described freedom dreaming as uh, dreaming as imagining worlds that are just representing people's full humanity, centering people left on the edges, thriving uh, in with solidarity with folks from different ideas who have struggled together for justice, and knowing that dreams are just around the corner. Um, uh, something there's a typo there of uh, people power. Okay. Um, so she reminds us of this, uh, uh, the importance of freedom dreaming. And um, so just uh, to take a quick moment, if you can think of one to three words that you believe teacher education should be about, what would those things be? Um, use the seven generation principle, right? Think about like, hey, if we can make an impact seven generations from here, what would that be? What would that word be that, that we, that I think I should focus on, okay? And if you can write it, in the document that Johnny uh, shared with you all, there's a space um, where it says Orlando shares work with peers, um, where you can write those words. If you can just take uh, two minutes to do that, it'd be really appreciated. All right, so I'm seeing here empathy, caring, inclusion, acceptance, empowering, plur pluralistic democracy, disruption, transformative care. Um, beautiful words, y'all, and and that's that's exactly what what we are are talking about, right? Is is how do we operationalize, you know, our values? Um, the whole reason why we got into education, and the and the whole reason why we why we want why we believe teacher education is fundamentally uh, important um, in 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 our uh, sphere of influence in our society as well. Um, so um, you know, this morning I was I was driving my kids to um, to school, and Lauren Hill comes up and she says, "How are you going to win when you ain't right within?" Uh huh. Come again, all right. So here she is talking about this very notion, right? I heard Ijoma saying some lyrics yesterday, and I'm not going to sing, um, but uh, but I did want to show 
uh, you know, this is what she's talking about, right? How are we going to get to where we want if we're not right within in our values and our philosophies um, as a teacher education program? And oftentimes, you know, we, we, we wait, right? And, and, and this group decided, like, we're not going to wait. We can't wait any longer. Our kids can't wait. Our youth can't wait. Our teacher candidates can't wait. And this is our story of how we decided to, to move with more urgency, okay? So this is, uh, I'm going to move into how we did, decided to do this with the ATPA. You know, um, how can we uh, operationalize some of our values? So um, this was, um, this is the ATPA uh, template, right? So um, this was a tension that I had in, in my class. I teach a class on ELD and um, it happens in the, in the winter. And it's during the winter when the students um, are doing the ATPA. And I always had this tension with, how much do I let ATPA come into my classroom, right? Um, you know, and, and this was a, a tension that I struggled with so much. So it took me three years to say enough of going back and forth with the ATPA. I'm just going to own it. Um, so the ATPA is going to be, the ATPA is not going to set the bar anymore. We're going to set the bar, right? So we decided to make the ATPA a Goldie Muhammad ATPA template. And as you can see there, um, where the arrow is, this is where um, uh, Eti, uh, Goldie Muhammad's uh, pursuits are, right? So we're asking all of our students that the ATPA, they must answer these questions and, and tell us how they're using identities, skills, intellect, criticality, and joy in the ATPA, right? So this is, this is what, it, what, um, you know, what they're about. Um, I'm not going to go over each one of them, but um, it's... it's um, it, it's in her book, and I recommend that that we all purchase this book so that we can be talking about um, the same language and using the same language to talk about some of these things. So we also said, okay, well, if our if we're going to ask our student teachers to do this, then we also have to teach our resident teachers about this framework, right? Because our resident teachers help our student teachers do the ATPA. So we decided to bring this in our resident teacher breakfast, right? Um, and this was happening as we're going, right? This is um, developing very organically. So we decided to do ATPA. Resident teacher breakfast is coming up. So we said, okay, let's move in this direction. So this is, um, you know, when we, um, a picture of pre-COVID, right? And um, we have this space where we, where we work with our resident teachers for three hours, right? And we do some professional development. We talk about things that are coming up and we talk about the ATPA. And we talk about we in this uh, in this session we talked about Goli Muhammad and what that was and how they can support our teachers. And this is this could be this is a very powerful space, right? Because again, this is the university hosting it, leading it, and saying, "Hey, this is what the university thinks that we should be doing as educators, right?" And it has a ripple effect, as uh, Dr. Mercado um, uh, Mercado talked about earlier. Um, so this is a template that I provided for them in, in my course, in my ELD course. I said, one of the assignments is that you're going to develop an overview of your ITPA. You're not gonna do the whole thing. You're just gonna give me an overview just so you can start thinking about it, right? You can see in the, in the, in the outline red there, that's where uh, Goldie Muhammad's pursuits are. They're gonna develop three lesson plans, just outline it, right? And tell us, um, you know, how these, um, how are you using Goldie Muhammad's framework in your ATPA. And I just want to show you what one student decided to do. If you can read uh, with the culture and historical responsive literacy, uh, this student said, students understand the importance and power of their voice and opinions. Students understand that persuasive writing and speaking can be a tool for activism and can be used to disrupt and dismantle oppressive systems. They are not just preparing to be activists, they are activists now, right? So you can see how our student teachers are are using the framework and, uh, and using uh, applying their own voice um, to um, to talk about right. So again, ETPA is no longer the bar. We're setting the bar, right? Okay. So that's just one example. Another example from another student. They this student decided to use a different format, but uh, included what how he was interpreting uh, Goldie Muhammad's framework. Uh, as far as identity, students will reflect on their own generational experiences with immigration and or become familiar with the experiences of others with these experiences. Intellect, using a text on immigrant experience by an author that is an immigrant herself, students share the lived experience of others, the concept of windows and mirrors, sliding glass doors. 
criticality. Students will, um, will go through collaborative discussion with one another, seek understanding of the experience of a marginalized community, immigrants by asking questions to further their understanding and drawing on the funds of knowledge of their classmates and their perspectives. And when, 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 we, when I saw this, I started saying, oh, um, I didn't realize what was going to come out, right? Because we just said, hey, you have to do this, and they did it. And, and we're seeing a much deeper connection with uh, that funds of knowledge. Oftentimes, our student teachers think about funds of knowledge of something academic that they did uh, previously, like, oh, before we did um, you know, fractions, so now they're ready to do this. And they're calling that funds of knowledge, but we wanted them to go deeper, right? And thinking about uh, funds of knowledge, asset-based thinking, cultural wealth, and a much deeper level. And we're starting to see it here in the ATPA. So, um, so th this next part is also, okay, so we have all these ideas. Um, these meetings every other week generated so many ideas that we knew what to do with, right? And so we started organizing them, right? So this is the vision and the dream. And I call it the vision and the dream because um, that's what it is right now. We're just trying to organize our ideas and thoughts. Um, we are starting to bring in uh, more people now so that we can start um, thinking about how we can institutionalize some of these things, right? And that's the next step. So, um, but first we did a little bit of reading. Um, we pulled uh, from an article um, uh, by Alison Titiano Cubales and uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade. This article um, got published by Teachers College um, this year, actually. And it talks about ethnic studies, but in this paper, they have a framework called Community Responsive Teaching. And they point out to three different areas, right? Relationships, relevance, and responsibility. Uh, relationship is about being committed to building meaningful relationships with students and families. Students do not care what we know until they know that we care. Caring relationships instill hope in young people as they serve as both medicine and armor for healing and future threats, right? And so Jeff talks about this, right? The, 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 um, one of the measures of, of, of success for young people is how many positive adults that they have in their lives, right? So this is um, something that we care deeply about. Um, so we thought that's fit, fit nicely with our values. Relevance, right? Is developing curriculum and pedagogy that connects to students' daily lives, their communities, their families, their ethnic, cultural, and linguistic histories. It's about being culturally rooted and critiquing systems that have created toxicity in our lives, right? Uh, and so what, the way we're looking at relevance is we are applying Goldie Muhammad's framework here. Okay, this is the whole Goli Muhammad piece. And then responsibility, understanding and responding to the wide range of needs, both social and academic, such as Dr. Mercado talked about, the impact of a student's capacity to be at their best, the well being of student is simultaneously about the individual student and the wellness of the community. All boats must rise because there's all of us or none of us, right? So th that, that is the idea that how successful are we if the kid next to us? is failing or, or having a hard time or uh, navigating you know, these structures, right? We all got to understand our, each other's plight in that sense and, and help all boats rise. Okay, so we just started organizing and say, okay, so if we were to think about how we're enacting relationships, relevance or responsibility, um, how are we doing it? We created a, a model here, um, just start organizing it, right? Uh, and at the bottom is this, this, this law of interconnectedness, right? As, as you can see, all these things are interrelated, right? This concept of in La Keche that the, the brothers and sisters from Arizona um, taught me at least about this, right? Um, you are my other me. We are all interconnected. And, um, and we're organizing it um, uh, using the C-Terran uh, diagram, right? The dri driver diagram. For those of you who have participated in it, this, this is looking familiar. So uh, the first one is the vision, right? The first box. And so we pulled from our vision statement that this is, this is how we see and, and think about it. We started putting, um, you know, the three concepts that we want to focus on, relationships, relevance, and responsibility. We started on the next level over is, you know, where are we doing this, okay? Uh, where, where are we seeing this in, in our own practice? So now we can say, oh, Orlando's doing it in this class. Here it is. Um, Susanna is doing it at her class, here it is. So we can start organizing where are these things being covered, right? And then the last column is about where do we need to grow, right? And you can see our TPA template is there, our supervision template is there. These are the areas where we want to um, 
uh, be better at, right? To move in this direction. So we're just moving more toward alignment and um, being more consistent with, um, with how we are practicing and operationalizing these values that we hold dearly. So just some takeaways, um, you know, change uh, can be joyous. I just wanna emphasize how, how um, beautiful these conversations have been. And, and for me personally, they have sustained me. Uh, we always have, um, you know, uh, department meetings or staff meetings. And, um, you know, th th these are important things that we need to talk about those things, right? To keep programs running. But it often is not the things that, that we, uh, uh, like to, um, uh, I'll just say they're, they're kind of boring, right? Um, but those are important, but um, sometimes often not the things that we want to deal with or the reason why we got into teacher ed, right? But in these meetings, uh, we set the agenda, right? We, we said, hey, this is important to us. How are we going to do this? Um, institutional change requires consistent commitment. Um, this this kind of change, institutional change, change around social justice, it's not going to happen if we dedicate, you know, 15 minutes at a meeting to this stuff, right? It's got to be consistent, weekly, right? And and enough time where we can um, uh, we can build. It's a slow cook, okay? It's not a fast cook. It's not a. This is a social justice meeting, right? It has to happen every um, so often, consistently, for this to start uh, occurring, right? So we can gain traction. Um, approaching the change from the ground level, or what Paulo Freire used to call from the inside out, provided a powerful collaboration amongst us as it promoted self-reflection, trust, and an opportunity to operationalize our values rather than defer to others. Um, and just final thoughts. Um, uh, I just wanna say that as teacher educators, our job is first and foremost to recognize that youth are sacred. And thus our work as teacher educators is sacred. Our power comes from our ability to see and hear what is happening inside the classroom daily and our capacity to develop the teachers who will develop the next generation of youth. As teacher education programs within a prestigious UC system, our role is to lead. As educators of our society, as students of the teachers that came before us and the teachers that will come after us, we were called to humanize the educational institutions that historically dehumanized our youth. We were called to use all our power and privilege to create humanizing and anti-racist projects that will benefit our youth for generations to come. Again, thinking seven generations down uh, principle, right? Thinking with that perspective. Um, I'll leave you with these words. Um, you know, we are just doing this as we go. I, I want to just re-emphasize that this is the way our journey is looking, given our particular context, right? So your journey um, is, is going to look different given your per particular context and constraints. Um, but this idea that there's no road, right? We create the road by walking. Um, so I believe uh, Johnny, um, that's the end of my part. Johnny is going to, uh, if there's some time to um, discuss, um, I'll hand it over to Johnny to close us up. I'll share one thing. One thing that I appreciate um, from Orlando's work is that, um, that going back to what I was sharing about the idea of problem posing and co-construction of work as humanizing, Orlando, you and your group decided you had this problem that needed to work on. It was about your supervision and about how to make it better for your teachers. And then in that group, in your group, I'm thinking about how you humanized each other by the collaboration you shared in to do right by your student teachers. So I've appreciated that in our conversations. Matt, thank you so much for taking care of us. Amy, thank you so much for sharing as well. I hope I didn't put you on the spot too terribly.